Well, there's an exciting night for stargazers, a trifecta of space wonders will illuminate the evening sky. Sounds like a poetry from the writers who wrote that for us. Illuminate, illuminate the evening sky. <laughs> <laughs> Onlookers might not only see a bright green comet streak by Earth, but also witness a full moon and a lunar eclipse all in the same night. Wow. All in the same night, I should say. So Derek Pitts is a chief astronomer at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, and he joins us now. Good to see you, Derek. Hi, Vlad. Hi, Christine. Thanks for having me tonight. Yeah, My pleasure. big night. So how common is it for all three of these spectacles to take place at exactly the same time? Actually, there are always lots of different kinds of astronomical <laughs> events happening at the same time. The question is, can we see any of them? And tonight, eh, we have some possibility of seeing some of them. So depending upon your weather conditions, you might be able to see just the moon. Maybe you can see both the moon and the comet tonight. So, you know, it depends a lot on that to begin with. You know, this eclipse is being referred to as the penumbral the penumbral, excuse me, eclipse. We're not scientists, Derek, as if you didn't know already. <laughs> <laughs> how does That's that differ? Here, how does that differ, differ from a thanks, Vlad, from a, a from a total eclipse? Yeah, that's a really great question. So here's how it works. When the Earth creates a shadow uh, that falls behind it, that shadow has two distinct parts. It has the darkest part called the umbra, and then that's surrounded by a lighter shadow called the penumbra. As the moon orbits the Earth, in a case like this, the moon can pass through the umbra in which you have a total lunar eclipse, or if it just passes through the penumbra, you have this penumbral eclipse. Now, the real difference in viewing is this. During the umbral eclipse, the coloring on the moon can be very dark, very dramatic, very striking. In a penumbral eclipse, depending on the degree of eclipse, if you will, it can go anywhere from almost unrecognizable to just above recognizable. Hmm. So this one happens to be a rather, as they're called, a deep penumbral eclipse. So hopefully, if folks go out and take a look in the next hour or so, right, you know, right now or the next hour or so, they'll be able to see that the moon has a little bit of a dusky shading on it, and that will begin to change uh, around uh, 9.30 this evening. They'll be able to see the brighter portion of the moon and maybe some of this dusky coloring as well. What about that comet? What should people be looking for there? So the comet is going to be a little bit trickier, actually. And the reason why is because when we talk about comet brightnesses, we often use descriptions that are very much similar to what we might use to describe star brightnesses. So let's just say, for example, we call a bright star a magnitude one star. Well, that's a pinpoint. If we talk about a comet as having that kind of brightness, we're actually talking about taking the diffuse head compacting it down, and then giving it that number. So what happens actually now is this comet has a magnitude level that's right around magnitude 8. And that's far below naked eye visibility. So to see this at all, you'll need a telescope, and you'll need to be someplace where the sky is dark and clear. If you can get to those locations and have a telescope, this comet has a really unusual feature, and that's its greenish color. And that comes from diatomic carbon in the comet, in this case out in space, that makes it look as if it has this eerie, ghostly, greenish color. So it's kind of a different thing for a comet. Yeah. So I guess we won't be going to Times Square. No, to see it, this with comet. all the lights there. <laughs> right, right. Not, not Times Square. But of course, from Times Square, you can certainly take a look at the moon and get a view of that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Shifting gears, early Friday morning, people in Washington woke up to a moon bow. Can you explain to our viewers what exactly that is? Yes, that's a really rare uh, a, a, a phenomenon to see, uh, but it's also really, really pretty. In this case, it probably, I'm sorry I didn't see it, but moonbows typically are a full circle of rainbow around the moon. And this full circle of rainbow is created by ice crystals that are very, very thin clouds, very, very high up, usually 22,000 feet up in the atmosphere. And the ice crystals that are in these cirrus clouds refract or bend the light that comes from the moon. And as it comes down into our atmosphere, it creates this rainbow ring around the moon. And it's just beautiful. But we see this typically on cold, crisp, 
clear mm -hmm. nights. So the rest of the sky is going to be beautifully clear, the moon will be nice and bright, but the thin cirrus clouds will give this ring effect around the moon. Very pretty. That is really cool. Derek, I have one quick question. So that comet is called 45P. I mean, what's it? What, what, I don't get it. What are you guys too busy to name them? They should have a name, right? Should they have a name? Oh, <laughs> Vlad, Vlad, you're going to be sorry you asked oh, because no. this comet actually has three names attached to it that are the three people that actually identified this uh -huh. comet some years ago. So you ready? Here it goes. It's Comet Honda Merkos Pajus. Pajusakova. Pajusakova. <laughs> there we go. Wow. So 45P. Let's just go with 45P. <laughs> that exactly. sounds much That's better. That's much easier for us news readers, you know. 45P sounds and, great. <laughs> and me too. I'll go for that. So the 45P, the 45P actually refers to its, uh, its year of discovery and the order in which it was discovered during that year. So if you count through the alphabet, you get down to P. That tells you in what order it was discovered that year. And that's how we can identify this comet. This is a comet that has a 5.25-year uh, period or orbit around the sun. And this weekend, it has its closest approach to Earth, a little over 7 million miles away. That's 20 times farther away than the moon is. But it's still the closest approach we'll get out of this comet this time around. That is really you cool. You are amazing to I talk know, to, Derek. I know, you are. We love science, and we love having you on, stuff. Derek. Thank you so much. Thanks Derek a lot, Pitt. folks. <laughs> uh